Our summer series, our summer teaching series starts today. We're going to start a journey through the New Testament writing of James. And in fact, um, James is the gospel. It's the gospel for all of the gaps in our lives, for our failures, and for all the ways that in our life we fake it. Uh, James is an incredible New Testament writing because... And what makes it so unique and so powerful is because James calls out his generation for how they live their faith. In fact, uh, uh, grammatically, in this little five chapters, there are 50 imperatives, 50 command statements in just five five, uh, chapters. Uh, That is more than any other New Testament writing. Uh, And the reason for that is because James is a pastor, and he's speaking in to the lives of uh, his people. He's speaking into their lives to live out their faith. In fact, James, James was the pastor of the Jerusalem church of the very first century from about A.D. 44 to A.D. 62. And so he calls them out, and here's the message of all that we're going to walk through this summer, he calls them out for how much the world was seeping in to their faith. And so he'll tell them that pure and undefiled religion is keeping yourself unstained by the world. He'll say that friendship with the world is fighting with God. It's enmity with God. And so he he just calls them out over and over about how they live out their faith. He calls them out for catering to rich people and making poor people feel invisible. He calls them out for having out-of-control tongues. He calls them out for their envy and their selfishness and their arrogance, their superior attitudes. He calls them at one point double-minded Double-minded means I'm trying to have it sort of both ways. Uh, I'm just wanting to get God's blessing, the really my motive for living for God in any ways, just to get his blessing. But at the same time, I want to live as much for myself as possible. That's double-minded. And so he calls them to live out a legitimate faith, a legitimate faith. He calls them out for their faith not being clear and obvious in the way they live their life. And so look what he's doing. He's saying, look, legitimize your faith. Make it real by how you live your life. So look, there's nothing new or profound or clever found in in James' message. Uh, what's wrong with James' message is that it's clear. (laughs) And it clearly confronts us. The core of the book, I think, is chapter 2, verse 18, I will show you my faith by what I do. And so he's just calling his generation and ours too to a legit faith. There's the series. And so uh, I think with James' message being that confrontive, that in our face, that in our generation, there is a first and natural response to that. Uh, And that is, I think the question that our generation would instantly have for James 
James because of, uh, uh, because of that confrontation. I think our generation's question for him would be, who does he think he is to think that he can speak into my life? Who, who does he think he is to tell me how to live my life? And I think that's an excellent question. Uh, what is it about his life that gives him any right at all to speak into my life, your life? I think we should answer that question the, with the first message. And so, if you have a Bible, James chapter 1, verse 1. If not, you can see it on the side screens. And so let's jump in and let's discover what right he has to say these things to us. And so it begins, listen to the word of God. So it begins, James 1, verse 1, James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to, to the 12 tribes who are dispersed, greetings and that's as far as we're going to go today that's as far as we're going to get just one verse i know i know you're you're doing the calculations this is not great evidence about how fast we're going to move through the book of james uh, because at this rate it will be a 108 part teaching series right so so look i'm you know uh do not fear i will speed up but as <laughs> But listen, as I, as I open my heart to this New Testament writing, the Holy Spirit would not let me out of verse 1. And so I, I, I want to just maybe uh, just sort of overflow out of what, how God spoke to me. And so there's a big question here, right? We're asking that question. We've already introduced it. And so it's this for our generation, this, this 50 commands, 50 imperatives in five chapters sounds a little bit over the top. It sounds a, a, a little intrusive. It sounds like it's getting up into my business. And so what right does he have? That's the question. What is it about James' life that gives him any right to speak into my life? Let's answer that. Who is he? And, and what is it about that that gives him any right to speak into my life? And I'll give you five who is he's. Number one, the person he was. This is going to give him the right to speak into our life, the person that James was. And so the very first word of this writing is James. And so, so the question is, uh, who could he be? Who could he be biblically? How, how do we know who James is? And so in the New Testament, there are actually some choices that you can make. And so uh, there are four of those. He could be James, the son of Zebedee, one of Jesus' 12 closest disciples who followed him for the three and a half years and then became an apostle. He could be another one of the disciples, um, James, the son of Alphaeus, or in one of the lists, he's called James the lesser oh i would not want to be called what has that done to his identity right to be called james the the lesser i wouldn't want to be called david the lesser uh, and so uh it could be him or or maybe uh, it could be uh, james the father of another one of the closest disciples Th that is one of the lists says that his dad's name was james and number four it could be james the half-brother of Jesus. Now, I don't, know if you, I don't know if you're familiar with this, and I don't know if you're accustomed to thinking like this, but, but do you realize Jesus had four brothers and at least two sisters? And the New Testament tells us that, Mark 6, 3, uh, Jesus goes to Nazareth to really announce his, um, uh, his Messiahship, and the community, this place where he grew up, they're offended. And so they answer, is this not the carpenter? That word is equally used, carpenter. That word is equally used as a day laborer, as a laborer. Um, is not this the day laborer, the son of Mary, the brother of, and they, and they name them, James and Joseph and Judas and, and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense of him. And so, so which which one of these four is he? 
That's the second like question. Uh, you know, who could it be, and which one is he? So, um, you know, I'm going to do a little bit of kind of history with you. And the reason I'm doing it is because, again, I want you to feel how legitimate the New Testament actually is. So, there are surviving writings from early church uh, historians, leaders, and historians like Eusebius. Eusebius. Uh, wrote a 10-volume history in about 300 A.D., just a couple hundred years or 250 years after these incidents. And in that volume, in that 10-volume history, he identifies the writer of this book as James, the brother of Jesus. Um, just again to show you that the New Testament isn't a book of myths and fables like the narrative around you uh, and, and made-up characters. There's an ancient historian named Josephus, Josephus was a contemporary of most of the people we know in the New Testament. In fact, it is believed that Josephus lived in Jerusalem at the very time that James was the pastor of the church of Jerusalem. And he writes about James, and he says about him that he is the brother of Jesus. And so we've got, like, real credibility here to say who is this? So who is this? Who is this James of James 1.1? He is James, the brother, the half-brother of Jesus. Now, can you absorb that for a moment? He's a human who grew up as a child with Jesus who turns out to be God incarnate, fully human and fully God. He slept on the floor as a child, <laughs> with his three little brothers and his older brother, Jesus. He witnessed the three-and-a-half-year ministry of Jesus firsthand. He felt firsthand the impact on his mother, Mary, of Jesus' arrest and trial and torture and crucifixion, and he saw that effect and felt it on his own mother. He knew that Jesus was executed and put into a borrowed tomb. And he knew the confusion and then ultimately the joy of the tomb being emptied out by Jesus. That's who this James is. That's the person he is. But secondly, there, there's something so massive here, it's just incredible, and that is it's what's missing from the verse. The second thing of who is he to speak into my life? The second thing is the title that he refuses. There is something so massively missing out of this introduction that I can't get out of it. There's something so important left out of his ID in the, in the introduction of this writing. The most important thing you could learn from his identity was the title that he refused to use. The most important thing about him is what he does not call himself. He refuses to call himself brother of Jesus. Okay, I'm, I'm just telling you, I'm sorry, but I just don't think I could resist it if I were at the same place, right? You know, you know the thing I'm most proud of is my humility, right? And so I... Uh, I I just don't think I could resist that. Put it into our 21st century context. If I were writing a, a blog that I wanted to take off, a Christian blog that I wanted to ta uh, take off, and I thought it was really important, and if I knew how important it was to build followers and, you know, to get my brand out there, get it, uh, get it going, and, and if I knew that, that to, get into the top tw to get into the top 10 Christian blogs, then I'm going to have to have over 4 million clicks to my traffic count, to, to my website, then, then I'm, I'm, I'm just going to have to say in that blog somewhere, have I mentioned that I share DNA with God incarnate, God in the flesh? I grew up with him. I have a unique insight into his life, and I've written it in my blog, mybigbrotherjesus.com. But why didn't James say it? Why couldn't he say, Jesus, my big brother? 
Here's why. There's a way to grade the reality of any meaningful experience. Um, and that is, sometimes it is with the hesitancy that is present to talk about it. Um, his spiritual journey of coming to fully realize who Jesus is was just so raw. It was, it was too powerful, too transforming, too meaningful to add on. Did I mention he's my brother? Because his experience with Christ was just too transforming to tag on now what feels so cheap to save is my brother. And so he refuses. He refuses that title. But there was an identity that he was fully willing to embrace. And that's what comes next. And it's number three. Look at it. And so uh, number three, number three, look at the identity that he was willing to embrace. And it's the very next word in the, that first verse. James, a bondservant. That word is slave. A bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. So what was he willing as the pastor of the Jerusalem church, the most significant first century, first generation church of Christianity. So what was he willing to call himself? How did he come to see himself? He said he embraced this identity, bondservant. So there are about, um, there are five words in the New Testament that all get, five different words that all get sort of translated into the word servant. And so James had at his disposal all five of these words. He could have chosen any of those five. Uh, and some of them, some of them are like really noble words. For instance, the word diakonos, diakonos. Do you hear a transliteration in that diakonos? We get our word deacon from that. It's actually a noble servant. There were civil servants in the first century that were called diakonos. And so it's this like really noble calling to be called this kind of a servant. Uh, there, there's another one of the five words. Uh, it's the word, listen to it, it's the word therapon. Therapon. Do you hear a transliterated word in that therapy? It means, a, it means someone who serves to heal. That's, that's very noble. But James chooses not number one or number two. James chooses number five. He calls himself doulos. Doulos. That word indicates bondage. It is the lowest form of slavery in the New Testament. And slavery is, as a human institution is detestable. It means a slave. But in his relationship to God, he says, when I look at myself, I'm most, my most accurate identity is bond slave. It means he, had, he, has no, he has come to have no rights of his own, uh, that, he is in, that he is in total possession of another. In other words, someone else owns him. This is how James viewed himself. He viewed himself as a due loss. Now turn it to your life. And men and women, this is about to get over the top. I, I'm about to be so clear and truthful here but, but in comparison to 21st, our generation's Christianity, this is about to sound so over the top that it's going to be hard to listen to. Because to have the identity of James in relationship to who is God to me, who is the Lord Jesus Christ to me, and how do I relate to them, James says it is as a doulos. And what does that mean? It means if you are a doulos of God, it means that God is in total possession of you. And I, I don't know if you can grapple with that and come out on the other side the same. It means that you, if you claim Christ, faith in Christ, it, mean, it means that you belong to him. It means that God is in possession of you. It, it, James belonged to God and 
to the Lord Jesus Christ. Think of your own life. Can, can you honestly, can you legitimately say the way my life is expressed, I belong to him? Number two, if you're a doulos, then you make yourself completely available to God. Completely. In the ancient world, the master could do whatever he would like with the slave. That's what makes it on the human level a, det a detestable uh, institution. He had the same power over his slave as he did over any possession. And so he had the power of life and death over his slave. And so if we say that we are bond servants of God, we are saying, I, I relinquish all of my rights to you, God. A believer surrenders all of his rights or her rights. Their right to live their life the way they plan. The right to have any old opinion they want to have about anything. They actually surrender that. They surrender the way they live to the master. And I, just, hey, I want to point out again... Doesn't this sound over the top? And doesn't that tell you where our generation's Christianity is in comparison to ancient Christianity, first uh, generation Christianity? Number three, if you're a doulos, then you believe that you owe total obedience, total obedience to God. The most important thing in your life as a doulos of God is, uh, is this, Lord, what do you want me to do? Ancient law was that a master's command was a slave's only law. And so my only response to my master, God the Father and our Lord Jesus, is what do you want me to do? Is that a part in any way of your faith? Number four, if you're a doulos, it means that you, you never take a vacation from serving your master. In the ancient world, the slave had, had literally no time of his own. No holidays, no time off, no working hours settled by agreement, no leisure. All of his time belonged to the master. Is, that any, is, is there any remnant of that in your faith toward God? My time is 100% yours. This is how he viewed himself. And so what right does he have? What right does he have to speak into my life? What is there in his life that, that has any right at all to speak into my life? And I would say that number three, it is how he came to view himself. There's a, num there's a number four. Uh, so what right does he have? Number four, what right does he have? not just the person he was, not just the title he refused, not just the identity that he embraced, but the way he saw Jesus gives him the right to speak into my life. And so there's this progression in, in his life of how he looked at, at Jesus. We're going to find that now in these next words, these three words, Lord, Jesus, Christ, here in verse 1. And, and, so, and so look at this progression of how he how he came to see Jesus. Do you know, as an adult, his first adult, mature perspective of Jesus is that he scorned him? And Mark 3 is one of those ways that we see that. Jesus has just launched his public ministry. He's in the Galilean area. He's been preaching and teaching, and his message is completely different than the rabbis of the day. It's radical. It's, it's, it's filled with these statements that God is with him, God's called him, that God is in him, that he himself is the Son of Man, that he is God. He, uh, and so the rumors start spreading about him. The, the rumors start spreading that, that Jesus thought that he had been... Sent out, he had been sent from God. The rumors were going out all over the countryside that he was, he, that he was going around teaching people 
that he was from God and that he was making people believe that he was working miracles and casting out demons. And so, and so his family comes to get him. You see that in Mark 3. And so when his own people heard of this, they heard these rumors. When they heard this, they went out to take custody. They went to take custody of him. It's like a, it's like a legal procedure that sometimes we go through in our generation. We become a custodian of someone who can't care for themselves for they were saying, he has lost his senses. They thought he'd lost touch with reality, that he was, he was in the middle of an episode. And so they came to get him in order to put him away somewhere. And then, and then it moves forward. He didn't just scorn him, but then in John 6, we see kind of a, it sort of ratchets up. In John 6, in John 6, Jesus is at the pinnacle of his popularity. This is like the pinnacle point of his, his popularity. That comes when he feeds 5,000, more than 5,000. Actually, it's 5,000 men, so times whatever. You know, that's probably 15 or 20,000 people, and he feeds them supernaturally, and that's all they need to say. Yep, we'll take you as our Messiah uh, if we can have this every single day. And so, and so there's this sort of threat that they take him by force. And so Jesus, Jesus is at this pinnacle of his popularity and within a few minutes he ruins it all because he turns on the crowds and he says to them no wait a minute I'm not doing I'm not doing you know free breakfast every day but what I will offer you is me eat my flesh, drink my blood. I will offer me as the sacrifice for your sin. And John 6, 66 says, in that moment, many large throngs of his followers withdrew and didn't follow him anymore. It was church growth in reverse. And just a few verses later, John 7, 5, for not even his brothers were believing in him. He rejected him. Then James rejected him, scorned and then rejected. But then, but then in those, those circumstances around the last week of Jesus' earthly life, then Jesus stunned him. He saw, he saw Jesus resurrect, uh, saw Jesus rejected, rejected and, and crucified and buried but then also resurrected. 1 Corinthians 15 says that Jesus appeared to him as resurrected, and he's just completely stunned and confused and dazed over what has just happened. And as he processes it and as he grapples with it, he himself comes to follow Jesus. It is this transformation in his life. And so, and so he comes to call him Lord Jesus Christ. James uses the word about his brother, Jesus, Lord. It's the Greek word kurios. In the Greek version of the Old Testament, when the Greek version of the Old Testament described the name, the personal name of God, Yahweh. You know, Yahweh is the I am that I am name. Yahweh is the name that describes God's self-existence, that he is above and beyond time, space, and matter, that he is outside of that, that he is all-powerful. I am that I am means his total sufficiency for uh, uh, anything. And so when the, when the Greek Old Testament describes Yahweh, it uses the word kurios. And now when James looks into the identity of Jesus, he uses the word kurios. James has come to fully believe that Jesus is the self-existent God of the universe. I can't call him brother. James has grappled with the fact that as a child, they played street games together. He's grappled with the fact that as siblings, they had sibling spats. With this being, uh, he's 
He's grappled with the fact he shared a sleeping mat with this being as a, as a brother. And after all he's seen and all that he's experienced and all the transformation in his life, he comes to call him Kyrios, Lord, Master of my life. And so what right does he have to speak into your life and in my life? It is because he has come to know Christ as Lord and you and you can't call Jesus Lord without acknowledging that he is more than a really good human you can't call Jesus Lord without acknowledging that he is God incarnate you can't call Jesus Lord until you are willing to bow with your life before him you, you can't call Jesus Lord without a, without a total loss of personal agenda. You cannot call Jesus Lord without coming under his leadership in your life. And so, and so it makes, a, this is like nearly the bottom line, and so it makes a desire to love him and a desire to obey him the same thing. They're not mutually exclusive. They're not an either or. Oh, I love Jesus with all of my heart. I don't really want to obey everything he said, but I really love him with all of my heart. No, you don't. It makes them the same thing. A desire to live in obedience to him becomes first in your life. There's a last one, and, and let, let's get on it. There's, there's a... What right does he have to speak into my life? The life he lived. The life he lived. Um, so how did Jesus affect his life? Do you know we know? We have biblical records and we have extra biblical records that are deemed as accurate. We know. Book of Acts and Galatians and 1 Corinthians all tell us that James became the leader of the church in Jerusalem. We know that sometime after 44 uh, A.D., up to 62 A.D. But he was better known by everyone and even his enemies, even the enemies of the Gospels, uh, as James the Righteous because he so lived out a genuine faith that it was just plastered over the front of his life. He shined like a star. And so uh, both historians, Josephus that I just talked about and uh, Hegesippus, writes about, they actually write about how James died. So historically reliable, uh, he was killed. He was killed by the religious rulers of Jerusalem in A.D. 62. And in fact, on Passover, A.D. 62, this happened. Do you know what today is? It's Passover, A.D. 2019. On this day, A.D. 62, the religious rulers in Jerusalem, they, they wanted to wipe out the exploding influence and power of this faith in Jesus. And so they picked up on a, on a new wave of persecution that was happening, and they took advantage of an office change of the, uh, of the uh, uh, Roman rulers. There was this period of time that one had gone away, and there was this gap before another one. And in that gap, in that gap is A.D. 62, and so they picked up on that, and they went and arrested James, James as the pastor of, of the Jerusalem church, and they took him, and... And they, they said to him, they said to him, this has got to stop. This, this, this fraud, this fraudulent faith in Jesus has got to stop, and you, you have got to stop it. And so on Passover this year, Passover 62, we're taking you to the top, this sort of top balcony of the, the temple, and we're calling on you to call him the fraud that he is. And so they take him, and he knows he's under threat of death and they take him to the parapet of the temple in Jerusalem in front of the Passover crowds that are swollen to tens of thousands and so the scribes and Pharisees call on him to deny Jesus this guy that they all know is a brother to him deny him tell the crowds that he was a fraud and so they turned to him and said that to him and and then he shouted as loudly as he could from the uh, from the parapet I tell you 
The Son of Man is sitting in heaven at the right hand of the great power, and he will come in the clouds of heaven. Amen. And the religious leaders were so rebuked and so humiliated that they took him and threw him off that top balcony of the temple, temple and his body hit the pavement down below and that didn't it injured him badly but it didn't take his life and so uh, the, the angry crowd began to stone him but he was able to get up on his knees uh, and he began he began to pray out loud he was just praying this over and over lord lord please forgive them lord please forgive them lord please have mercy on them and that was even worse to their ears and and so finally someone someone took a club and they struck him violently in the head and he was in heaven he gave his life fully completely totally as a bond servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ does that give him the right to say to you and me consider it all joy my brethren when you encounter various trials knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance and let endurance have its perfect result that you might be perfect and complete lacking in nothing let's bow together We're going to enter a time of response right now. And I really want us to get alone. Could we do that? Would you be willing to do that? Just get alone in your thoughts between you and God, about you and God. And I want to acknowledge something as we do this. I want to acknowledge the response that, man, this just... This just feels way over the top. And I want to acknowledge that in comparison to the cultural faith that you see around you, this is way over the top. But do you get that this is completely consistent with ancient Christianity, with first generation Christianity James is calling us out he's calling me out name yourself as a doulos a bond servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ I'm asking you right now in prayer to grapple with what that means that you give up. Grapple with what it means for Jesus to be Lord in your life and just be honest with yourself. Are you willing? And what does that answer tell you about you? Christianity is a servant life toward Christ as my Lord. There it is. And Father, I just want to pray for a deeper, for me, a deeper sense of reality that Jesus is Lord over me. And God, I pray that you help. God, I'm asking for your power to help me live legitimate faith faith that shows in the way that I live I pray it now in Jesus name